one, two. Check, one, two.
Good morning. Welcome to Christian Life Center. Will you please stand with us as we get ready to praise the Lord? Nothing can separate, even if I ran away, your love. I know I still make mistakes. You have new mercies for me every day. Your love never fails. No, no. And you stay the same. For my good, you make all things work together for my good. No, you never fail me, no. creating one God Almighty through your Holy Spirit conceiving Christ the Son Jesus our Savior I believe in God our Father I believe in Christ the Son I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three and one. 
I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again for I believe in the name of Jesus oh in the name of Jesus sing our judge and our defender our judge and our defender suffered and crucified forgiveness is in you descended into darkness you rose in glorious life forever the Holy Spirit. Our God is three and one. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. For I believe in the name of Jesus. Yes, I believe in the name Jesus, oh, I believe, I believe you rose again. I believe in life eternal. I believe in the virgin birth. I believe in the saints' communion and in your holy church. I believe in the resurrection when Jesus comes again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. Sing, I believe. I believe in God our I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. For I Every time I face the waves, I don't want to be afraid. Oh, I don't want to be afraid. I don't want to fear the storm just because I hear it roar. 
I don't want to fear the storm. No, I don't want to fear the storm. These waves are only waves. I'm not gonna be afraid. Oh, I'm not gonna be afraid. I'm not gonna fear the storm. You are greater than its roar. I'm not gonna fear the storm. Oh, I'm not gonna fear it. envelop me and let faith rise up oh heart believe let faith rise up in me oh, oh. let faith rise up oh heart believe let faith rise up in me lift your voices Rise up, oh heart, believe, let faith rise up in your peace wash over me let your peace surround us lord take over our hearts and let faith rise up oh heart believe let faith rise up in me oh, oh. let faith rise up oh heart Rise up in me, sing it again. Let faith rise up, oh heart, believe. Let faith rise up in me. Lift it up, let faith rise up, oh heart, believe. Let faith rise up.
At this time, if we could have the prayer partners come out to either side, if there is anyone out here today that needs to just go to the Lord, um, needs that uplifting encouragement, uh, needs to stand in faith with someone else that will lift up your prayer to God with you, we just encourage you to find one of those prayer partners and do that at this time. And we'll continue to worship.
coming out this morning in worship and prayer and all things, I, the word trust was popped up in my mind, and, and then I heard this song come on, and, and I was thinking to myself that, you know, there's a lot of folks in here today who you come into church, and you've been coming for weeks or for years or whatever, and and, and you've you've grown in a relationship with God, and, and you've gotten to that place of trust, and when you worship, you worship just with absolute reckless abandon and all those things, and you go after it and all those things. But I couldn't help but think that there are folks here in this room today that are that need a touch from God in this message, in the worship and everything we do this morning, to remind them to trust again, that they've been hurt by people, that they've been hurt by so many others, and that kind of reflects on their ability, and, and you don't realize how much that actually affects your ability to worship and do all things, but it really does. A person will come into church, and they'll come in like, oh, I'm, I'm coming with a great attitude and all those things, but I have a lack of trust, and it's hard to worship. It's hard to do all things, and and I just want to pray for those today. If that's you, I'm not asking you to raise your hand. I just want to pray for you right where you're at. So church, would we just bow our heads together and just pray? And if that's you today, I just want to pray for you. God, I just pray for those who have been struggling with trust today. God, I pray for a miracle for them today, God. God, I pray like pastors been preaching in this series. God, I pray for a miracle. God, we're talking about when you come up empty today, and and God, they're probably at that place where they're lacking trust and so much more, and they would say with their heart and their words and everything else, that God, I trust you, but God, they've gone through so much, and, and maybe it's left them grizzled, or maybe they've been hurt by other people, and so today, God, I just pray that you would reveal that whenever they reveal your heart to them, that whenever they leave this place today, they leave their this place with arms wide open, ready for whatever you have for them, God. I pray for them to be able to get to that place. And I pray for all our families and everyone that's watching online and that's in here in our service today. There's so much going on in our world. There's so many things that we want to not trust, and there's many things that give us reason to not trust them. But God, I, God I'm thankful that we can trust you, that you are trustworthy, that you are good, that you are everything. And so God, I pray that as we worship that as we hear your word today, we go after you. We're stirred by the fact that we can trust you, God. We love you. We honor you. We give you praise. And we're grateful to be in your house today with other believers. And with those struggling, everybody. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, can we just give God praise? He's worthy, amen, church? He's, a, he's worthy. Why don't you turn to somebody today and just make them feel welcome. Meet somebody you've never met before. Make them feel welcome. Invite them in for a hug or a handshake. We're so glad that you've joined us this morning. 
we want to take just a minute and show you some ways that you can connect here at CLC. If you're new here, we'd love to connect with you. In our upper foyer, we have a red connection table with a gift waiting on you, so feel free to come up at any time and we'd love to connect. Hey, come join us for our Wednesday night services on Encounter Nights. We have something for everybody and the whole family. We have something for the adults, kids classes, youth, and um, support classes. We're so excited to have and share for y'all. Listen, on Encounter Nights, we are concerned with two things. That's encountering God and encountering people. These are the greatest two commandments that Jesus gave us. So it's so important to connect with the body of Christ. So we really encourage you, come out, join us on Wednesday night, get connected with God, what God's doing here. We're so excited to have you. If you're new to CLC, feel no obligation to give. But if you're looking for a giving opportunity, you can give in three different ways. Drop off your giving at one of our boxes on the second and third floor. Give online at clclayton.org slash giving. Or text to give, text CLC to 73256. Thanks for all you're doing here at CLC. Thanks for being here with us today at Christian Life Center. Here's a few more ways you can stay connected. One, you can download the CLC Layton app. Just search CLC Layton on your app store. You can find us on Facebook and Instagram by searching at CLC Utah. And we also would love for you to download the Church Center app. By downloading the Church Center app and searching for Christian Life Center, you can find all of our life groups, events, and signups for a lot of things that are happening here at CLC. It helps you stay even more connected. We know this morning God has an important word for you today. So thank you for joining us and being a part. God bless and have a blessed day. Good is God. Amen, church. We serve a good God. Come on, let's give God praise, man. What a great day. It's time for a baby dedication, but we're going to come down to the floor here with this family, uh, Mark Merrill and his, uh, his beautiful uh, grandkids and family and all together here um, with these two beautiful people, Chantry and Dakota, uh, been a part of our family for a very, very long time. And what is little one's name again? Remind me. Indy, Indy, and, and then Harper, her big sister right here, uh, beautiful. How old is Indy now? Indy is three months old, um, and Shanshi's grown up in this church, and Dakota's become a big part of our family too, um, and we love these guys, and this is kind of a really big part of why we get to do what we do as a church. Hi, gorgeous. How you doing? You doing good? Yeah, I got a smile. And spit bubbles. All right, Fantastic. That's the good stuff right there. All right. The reason we do baby dedication is it is for the baby, but it is very much for the family. It's the reason why we do baby dedication. It's it meant to be something that the family is making a concerted effort and a focus that what we're going to do is raise Indy and raise Harper, as we did with Harper as well, in a home where Jesus is the center. Amen, church? Uh, that's really our focus here. And so that's what we want to pray over this family today. A great couple, really great people, um, and we love them so much, and we want to pray. So church, would you stretch out a hand with me today, and let's pray for this beautiful baby girl, and let's just be thankful for this great family. Lord, I thank you so much for little baby Indy. She's such a joyful, beautiful little girl who is just so filled with your joy, God. And God, I thank you for her mother and for her father and for grandpa and the whole family that have chose to build their family in such a way where Jesus is the rock, he is the center, he is everything, he is the focus. And God, we pray for this family, a prayer of dedication, that they would remain dedicated to serving you, God, in every single way. God, that they would lift you up in all parts of their lives, showing Indy, ooh, yeah, you got it right there. You work it out, sis. You're good. Showing Indy what it means to be a man of God and showing Harper as well what it means to be a man of God and a woman of God and a family that makes Jesus the center. God, we pray that prayer, dedication for them today. We love you. We honor you. We give you praise, and we thank you for families that make this a priority. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Can we give God praise for these guys? Mike, are you taking a picture? Okay, let's get a picture of the fam right here. Okay, 
Fantastic. Hey, give this family one more big hand. If I could have the Smiley family come and join me up on the stage. We did to do a baby dedication today, but on top of that, we also have to say goodbye to a good family as well. Um, and, uh, and this is a family that has moved in. Where are you guys moving to? Florida? Florida? Oh, man. Florida. All right. I like me some Florida, okay? Um, I don't like the humidity, but I like Florida, okay? Um, but, man, we are sad to see these guys move. Great family. Incredible family. Uh, Joe and Marie have been a, 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 just a, a big, important part of the church. I have loved them. So, so involved in everything kids involved and just really a big part and they've been just a blessing since the day they got here to our church uh and i just wanted to give them an opportunity to just if there's anything that joe that you'd like to say you're good i figured joe wouldn't say much joe's typically a man of a few words but mom anything you want to say you kind of put me on the spot here but um i don't know just thank you i don't I'm not. I'm still not really sure why the Lord brought us to Utah for such a short amount of time. When Joe retired from the military, I was ready to put down roots. I was like, "All right, we got a job in Utah. That's where we're going. Can we please stay for 15 to 20 years?" And then the Lord said, "This wasn't the place for us to stay." So while we're excited for whatever new adventure the Lord has for us in Florida. It's also, um, like, sad to say goodbye, because especially the last uh, year, just um, so many of you have touched our lives, touched our hearts, and um, it's the hardest part about leaving. I just wish there were several people I could take with me. Um, but I know that, that our time here, the Lord has definitely worked in our lives and all of our lives and our family. And um, and I am grateful to say that I think, you know, we blessed others while we were here as well. So just thank you for all you guys have done as a church and for our family. We just will miss you all. Give this family a big hand, man. We love these guys. And honestly, this a big part of being the church is this is what it looks like, is we get to see families move in, and we unfortunately have to see families move out and some will dig roots in here like you were saying for a very very long time but here's the kind of strange thing the smileys will always have roots here at clc as a part of our family because they have friendships because they have connections with us we'll stay connected through social media and other things if they're ever out this way they know where they can always go i there's another family that's visiting today where's the taylors at today the taylors up top visiting today they moved to arizona years ago and they're still very much a part of this church family anytime they hear they call this family and so uh let me tell you that's just what it is to be a part of what we're doing here at clc so can we stretch out a hand again and pray for this great family lord we thank you so much much. I thank you for the entire Smiley family, God. God, they've gone through so much here. They've gone through a lot. Friendships um, and growing opportunities and connections um, that will last a lifetime. And God, we thank you. Those will never go away. Those will remain. But you've called them into a new season and a new area to be, to plant roots for hopefully a very long time. And God, I pray that for them, that they find the peace they need, the place they need to be, and they're following your will in every way. God, I thank you so much for Joe and Maria's parents that have led in such a great way and have made Jesus the center and have just been great, incredible people to work with as a pastor. They have been a blessing to me um, and to our entire pastoral staff, and their kids have been a blessing to us as well. We're sad to see them go, but they'll always be a part of our family. So we pray blessings and traveling mercies over them today in Jesus' name. Amen. Can you give them one more big hand? And when you see them today, give them an extra big hug or goodbye. Oh, man, that's a tough part of being the church, but it is a big, important part of what it means to be the church today. All right, let me announce a few things for you today. But first, before I mention those things, let me invite out the man, the myth, Pastor Ernie Green. Give a big hand for this guy right here. I have a hat that says a legend in his own mind. <laughs> well, it's that time of year again. I love Christmas. I love the time of sharing together and, and celebrating the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 
and we're coming up to our annual PTL Christmas dinner party. And we have a great time, folks. That's a great time of celebrating and enjoying each other's fellowship. And if you don't know it, PTL means Prime Time Live, which is our seniors' ministry here at CLC. And the theme this year is the softer sounds of Christmas. And it's going to be on December the 10th at 4 p.m. at the usual place, Jeremiah's, which is a great place to get together and have this dinner party. And tickets are on sale in the upper foyer. And we can only have 80 total. And so if you want to come, and we hope you will, uh, make sure you get up there today and get your name on the list and get your tickets because we really look forward to this and we have a great time of celebrating Christmas. So come and be with us. God bless you. Give a hand for Pastor Ernie Green. That's my mentor, my man right there. Um, and I know that Janelle had mentioned earlier, Ernie, that you guys had sold like over half the tickets already. Uh, and so uh, please make sure you make it a point to get up there today. Before we get into the message today, let me mention a couple other final things I'd like to let you know about. One, um, shoe boxes. So every year, we're trying to be ahead of the game on everything this year to make it easier on your family because you guys have been incredible. When we started doing Thanksgiving donations, which I'll mention in just a moment, like in one Sunday, we saw close to $4,000 come in for Thanksgiving meals. Can we give God praise for that? How, how absolutely incredible. Between turkeys and everything, and I'll mention all that in a second, but shoe boxes and Giving Tree are both going on right now. Shoe boxes you can pick upstairs at the, you'll see at the growth track table up in the corner of the foyer. Uh, go and see me and Tawny upstairs right after service. If I'm not up there, Tawny will be there. Um, and she'll be doing a dance just so that you know where she's at. And she'll be up there handing out shoe boxes. The shoe boxes are free. We provide a list of the things you need to go get. You help fill the shoe box. The shoe box we get back, we give to kids in communities where they aren't able to really do much of anything at all for Christmas. We usually give them to a lot of refugee communities in Salt Lake, Marshallese areas, and a lot of this. So, so it's a huge help to Pastor Alfred and his ministry. It's a great thing for us as a church. While a lot send a lot of boxes overseas with Samaritan's Purse, we try to really do whatever we can to pour into our local community and our areas that have a great need, because there is a big need in our community. Amen, church? Huge need. Also, Giving Tree supports people directly in your church. So if you're scanning this code today, it's super simple. If you want to give a Giving Tree gift, it's so simple. You can scan this, go buy items off that Amazon list, literally have them shipped here to the church. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to carry anything here. We make it so easy for you that you can go buy these gifts and consider helping a family this year if you would. It would be a great gift to us. So check out Giving Tree. You can also stop at the Giving Tree upstairs um, while you're passing the great women's ministry table down there where they're selling all kinds of crafts, goodies. And I'll just tell you, if you see the salsa up there, you need to buy it. Joanne Brooks like, makes a mean salsa. It's really, really good, okay? So check that stuff out. Go up there. Finally, uh, a couple other things. Baptisms are today. Ten people are being baptized today. Can we give God praise for that? How awesome. Come over. You might not know any of the people being baptized. That's all right. They're in the family of God right now with you, okay? So we're gonna, they're going to join you, so why don't you join them over there in the Children's Center after church. Celebrate with them as they're being baptized. Some kids, adults, teenagers, all ages. Also, surviving the holidays, a special class. And I've had several people actually ask me, because there's a lot of people, not only in this church and many churches out there, that are lonely around the holidays. They're struggling. Maybe they've lost someone in their family, whatever it may be. This isn't just for people that have gone through separation or divorce. This class is for anyone who is just lonely and struggling on any level around the holidays. Because the holidays, while they're beautiful and great, they can be really tough on some people. Um, and so I want to encourage you, no matter where you are in stage of life, if you feel like the holidays are something you need to just survive, you need to be in this class this Wednesday at 6.30. It's going to be a great class taught by Jody and Tim. Make sure you check it out. It is an incredible class for all people. And then finally, uh, like I said, Thanksgiving donations have been incredible. You have been an amazing church. As Pastor mentioned a couple weeks ago, by no means um, do you need to give to any one of these areas. If you're struggling, 
You don't need to. And if you're struggling, and you're struggling to even buy a Thanksgiving meal this year, these meals don't just belong to the community. They belong to you as a church first. So if you are a part of CLC and you want a Thanksgiving bag, all you got to do is reach out to us. We will make sure that you have a turkey and everything you need. We don't want anyone in this church going without, and we want to provide as many as we can for our community. Um, and so remember that. But we need all our donations in by this Wednesday the 16th so we can build bags. Also, if you want to help us volunteer, and it is one of the best volunteer days of the year. It's so awesome. This coming Saturday, we're handling, handing away Thanksgiving bags. We're sorting a ton of food. Love My City volunteers are needed this Saturday at 11.30 a.m. to help us sort food, prepare things, so that we can help hundreds of families this Thanksgiving. Thank you for just being the great church you are. God bless you guys, and have a great Sunday. All right. Thank you, Pastor Rob. Well, thank you for joining us here today. If you're here in person for the first time or watching online, thank you for taking time to join us. And whatever's brought you here today, it's going to be good that you are here. Um, we want to mention our boys' football team. They're not here this morning, I'm sure. I don't see them. Uh, they didn't come in till last night, I think rather late. But they won the state championship football for the first time. <clears throat> We're very proud of them, and there's going to be a banquet for them on Wednesday from 5 to 7, I think. And Karen, if you can send me the address and phone number of where that's at, that would be great. Uh, but we congratulate them. They represent us very well throughout the year. Um, the athletic part of it and winning was awesome. It's the first time we've ever won a state championship, but how they handled themselves was far more important than winning, and we're proud of them. Also at 5 o'clock today over in the youth room, which is up on the main lobby, and to my left, your right, <laughs> uh, we will have our meeting for those going to Israel, and if you're interested in going and want to attend, you're welcome. We are getting close to having to shut down uh, those going so we can get our final uh, preparations made, but five o'clock this afternoon. Let's pray and we'll get right into our message. Heavenly Father, we thank you again today for this wonderful opportunity to share your word, to let the Holy Spirit speak into our hearts and our lives. We're very grateful to be a part of your family, to part of your kingdom's work. Uh, we, we just cannot fully comprehend the fullness of your love for us. Uh, we recognize as much as possible how you so loved us that while we were yet sinners you died on that cross for our sins and all the promises that you have made and we even sing about some of those in our songs this morning there's just so much you have for us here on this earth and I pray that today as we talk about the time of miracles and how we need miracles in our lives that people will open up their hearts and as Pastor Rob mentioned trust you this morning and allow the miracle to happen in their life. And we give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. We are continuing a five-part series on when you need a miracle. Today is part four. And it is when you come up empty. Our text will come from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 5, verse 1 to 11. And we'll read that in a few moments. But if you know any fishermen, you've heard some great fish stories. And some of them are probably a little fishy. I'm not a fisherman, not a hunter. I just don't do that. Don't golf. I did start eating more chicken. But, but I've heard a lot of fish stories, and I have been fishing. Uh, it's interesting. But today we're going to look at one of the great fishing stories of all times. And if you have ever felt discouraged by your job, your marriage, your finances may be discouraged with yourself. You're not getting anything accomplished. You're fatigued. You've been working yourself to the bone, as we would say. You've put yourself out there, your heart, your soul, your efforts, into something into your life, whatever it may be, and it's just not going anywhere. You're empty. You're going through the motions. You're emotionally, if not dead, hardened, uh, you're discouraged, if not even depressed. And you're just struggling to find some direction in life as to where you go from here. Because it's just not working. Any aspect or multiple number of aspects of your life could fall into this category today. 
And if so, whether you're in person here today or watching online, you picked the perfect Sunday to be at Christian Life Center. There's some background on our New Testament story here that I want to give to you for those who may not be that versed in Scripture. Four of the twelve disciples were fishermen. Peter and Andrew were brothers, and James and John were brothers. Now, these four guys had a fishing business. They were professionals. They were in northern Israel around the Sea of Galilee, or you'll see in the text, uh, the Lake of Gennesaret. Same difference, Sea of Galilee, Lake Gennesaret. And at this point of the story, they're not disciples. They're just professional fishermen doing what they've always done from the time they were a lad. Professionals now as adults, they've been out fishing all night long, and yet they have caught nothing. They've worked hard. They've come ashore after between nine, ten hours of work fishing. They're now cleaning their nets, and they're tired, and they're discouraged. I'm sure most of you, if you have a project, either in your uh, secular job or on a home project, and you work ten hours and you made no progress whatsoever, that's frustrating. Now, being raised a hillbilly, that usually translates into my dad trying to save money, not hiring a professional. We do it ourselves, and at the end of the day, we wasted the materials we spent money on, had to take it all down and go buy new material the next day and wasted the whole day's work. You know that. You don't have to be a hillbilly to have experienced that. But with all of this discouragement, Jesus comes along. And that's where we pick up our text in Luke chapter 5, verse 1 through 3. And I'm reading out of the New International Version, which is modern English for those of you that are new with us and don't know. It's a translation, just like the King James is just in modern English. One day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, or Sea of Galilee, the people were crowding around him and listening to the Word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, that's Peter, and asked him to put out a little from shore. And then he sat down and he taught the people from the boat. Well, Jesus gets into one of these boats, pushes out a little bit from shore, because if you know anything about the dynamics of sound there, um, it's incredible, but the water, the sound bouncing off the water magnifies that, and the people on the shore could hear much better. So that's what he was doing. Now, Jesus is about to ask these four fishermen to leave their business, which was a prosperous one, notwithstanding the night's uh, difficulties, and to follow him. He knows what's about to happen. So he's planning to do a miracle that they will understand. Understanding is important. You can say, well, I communicated with so-and-so. Unless they understood, you didn't communicate. You just talked. Communication requires understanding. And so he was going to do a miracle in which they would understand a miracle of fish to a bunch of fishermen. And let's look at verse 4 and 5. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night. Now remember, they're not disciples yet. They're not followers of Christ yet, but they know who he is. And they had respect for him. Everyone had heard of the miracles he had done, the power in which he spoke the word, and the wisdom in which he spoke. So Simon answers him with great respect, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, you who? You who that I'm not following yet, but I have respect for because I've seen, heard of the miracles you have done and how you preach and how you teach and what people are saying about you. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. A lot of powerful stuff in those words. 
My question to you to begin with here is, have you ever felt like this? You've given it your best shot. You've worked hard. You've been diligent. But you have absolutely nothing to show for it. You've worked hard on your marriage. You've tried reading books. You've tried counseling. You've done all kinds of things, and your marriage is in the same rut that it's been in for however long. You're the best worker on the job. You put in the extra effort, pay attention to the details, and yet when the tough times came, you were the one laid off and others far less productive than you kept their job. When these fishermen did what Jesus said to do, they received a miracle. Miracles aren't to be taken lightly. Miracles aren't coincidences that happen to line up just right and everybody gets warm fuzzies. Miracles are when God reverses the natural order of things to create something out of nothing that only God can do. You can't do it. No matter how much extra effort you put into it, you can't do it. That's a miracle. And a miracle occurred for these guys, and they were blessed beyond what they were able to handle. And as a result of that, their lives were changed forever. If you receive the miracle of the new birth, in other words, you become a true Christian, a follower of Christ, that miracle alone will establish within you a faith that will not be shaken. If you're just going to church and turning over a new leaf, if you're just trying to hang out with better people, if you're just trying to learn out some new philosophies or what you believe to be better philosophies in life, then there's nothing really changed about you on the inside. There's been no miracle. You're just changing jerseys on which team you're going to suit up with, the church team versus the non-church team. But if you have a miracle of the new birth, you bow your heart before Jesus Christ, confess your sins, invite him into your heart and life, and from that day forward, commit yourself to trusting in him in all things and absorb the scriptures and apply the truths to your life, that new miracle will establish a faith in you that will not be shaken by Satan or neighbor or family or friend. Very critical to understand that. And from that miracle of new birth, the doors are open for a multitude of miracles to occur in your life. And if you've lived for Christ very long, you, like I, have experienced miracles in your life where God has supernaturally intervened in our lives to resolve issues, to give clear direction, to provide healing in the body, clarity of mind, open doors, closed doors, all by God's divine hand as he orders the steps of the righteous, if you please. That's not perfection, but people who are following him and who have made him Lord over their life and not just a, a cheap savior, for lack of better words. Because in my humble opinion, he can't really be your savior if he's not going to be your Lord. That, you can argue that theologically, and I accept that. But it just is a hard struggle for me to understand how a person can accept Christ into their life and yet not allow him to be Lord. Now, I I, I'm going to move on. You can argue with me, and that's fine. And I say that quite sincerely. It's not my place. The Lord will judge that. But my life experience says when I gave my life to Christ, he didn't just become my Savior, so I got a cheap ticket to get out of hell and go to heaven, but he became Lord over my life. And from the time I was 12 years old, in spite of my human frailty and my falls and failures, he was faithful to lift me up and pick me up and keep me going on because my heart's desire was for him to be Lord over all of my life, not just my Sunday morning church going. Set that aside. Luke chapter 5, verse 6 and 7, continuing. When they had done so, that is, cast their nets into the water, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. Now that other boat, of course, was James and John's boat. It was Peter and Andrew's boat that Jesus was in. Now, here's the point. They caught more fish in 10 minutes 
than they did previously in 10 hours because and only because they followed the instructions of Jesus Christ. That's the only reason. All of the other human efforts and elements of which they were professionals at had failed them. And when you come up empty in your life, and this is a tough place to be. Empty is a tough place to be. You can have so much blessing in your life, you can't hold it all by yourself. You can get there. But the key is faith in Jesus Christ and two, doing what Jesus says to do. You will not move from your empty place emotionally, spiritually, financially, marriage, health, or whatever else issue it could be. You won't move from that empty place to a place of blessing and fullness and miracle, if you please, unless you do it in faith in Jesus Christ and doing what he says. These guys took four steps of faith. These steps put them and they will put you into a place or position for a miracle. The Bible gives us these instructions to help us. It's not just to give us something to think about or talk about. The Scriptures are given to us to put into application into our lives that we might receive the fullness of the fruits that Christ intended for us to have. So here they are. Number one, give Jesus complete access to my life. If you need a miracle today, you're empty in particular, the first thing you've got to do is give Jesus complete access to your life. Look back in verse 3 of our text. He, being Jesus, got into one of the boats. You've got to get Jesus in your boat. That's the starting point. Ten hours, nothing. Now in the same boat, Luke writes that their nets were full even though it's the same lake the same nets and the same fishermen their nets are full of fish overflowing such that their boats were starting to sink what's the difference Jesus is in the boat I don't go anywhere without Jesus which means I do my best not to go anywhere Jesus doesn't want to go in Hello. I don't say, hey, Jesus, you hang outside here. I'll be back in a couple hours. If I don't, would you just send someone in to drag me out? If Jesus doesn't want to go in there, you ought not be going in there either. Okay, that was meddling, so let's go on. I'm telling you, it's a game changer in people's lives. When you get Jesus in your boat, the Bible tells us, and I'll paraphrase it, there ain't nothing Satan can throw at you that will sink your boat. It may rock it. It may overwhelm it in many ways with waves. But if necessary, you'll walk on water with Jesus Christ. You can be battered. You can be bruised. I'm not saying you'll go through life without the challenges that are common to the human race. But you will go through it, as Paul said, unlike those who are without hope. We are a people of hope. We are a people of Christ. We are a people who have the power of Almighty God who created the heavens and the earth and everything that resides in it, working specifically for us. Your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. Your specific name, with that middle name you don't want anybody to know, it's in the Lamb's book of life. <laughs> and he knows the number of hairs on your head. That's, that's, those are just scriptures, right? I don't know about the middle name. It says your name will be written. I assume the middle name will be there. <laughs> Jesus in the boat. They're not fishing by themselves anymore. I'm not pastoring you by myself. I'm not bearing the load of the church and the school by myself. Otherwise, I'd have quit a long time ago. 
I'd have said, forget you. I'm going back to southern Missouri or to the hills of Arkansas and just watch the rabbits. I've got Jesus in my boat. And the Scripture says, what? That because of that, I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me, right? Come on now. Those of you that are here for the first time, we always let out by 1 o'clock, so don't worry about it. <laughs> well, so what does having Jesus in your boat really mean? It means unequivocally dedicating your entire being to God. Not half your being, not most of your being, and certainly not 10% of your being, your whole being. It's not just about your salvation. It's about your entirety of life, how you live your life, how you make decisions. Not for your parents, not for your siblings, not for your kids, not for your neighbor, not for your church. How you make decisions in your life for your God that you serve, that you have yielded yourself to, that you have humbled yourself before, that you have surrendered to and said like Jesus did on the cross, not my will, but your will be done. That's what it means to have Jesus in your boat. Whether you're at home or at work or at school or on vacation, your finances, your marriage, your friendships, it doesn't matter. You dedicate everything to God for His use. You go back to Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, and Matthew writes this, but seek first His kingdom. It's Jesus' words, but seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. You'll notice that we're to seek God first in all things, not second, third, or fourth, or last resort. And we're to seek His kingdom. We died to ourselves that we might live in Christ. That's more than a slogan. We're not politicians. We don't speak out of both sides of our mouth. We don't say one thing and do another. As a general practice, I would certainly hope. We are kingdom-minded people, and we align every aspect of our behavior, our life experiences, our inner and thoughts and outer behaviors with what the kingdom says we should be doing or thinking or saying. It's not about success. It's not about salaries. It's not about satisfaction. It's about His kingdom. And that's why we deny ourselves on many occasions the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, all of these things. We deny that we might be kingdom focused. And you note that when we do these things, Jesus said all these other things will be given to you as well. So what does it translate into? It's pretty simple. You have to get your priorities right. If you want and need a miracle today, whether it's germane to the specifics of today's uh, title of being empty in life or some other aspect of your life, if you're going to receive that miracle, you've got to get your priorities right. I personally know of, I won't tell you the numbers, but of people who were first-round draft picks in Major League Baseball who never made it but token appearances. And the reason was because of the decisions they made that were not good decisions, primarily related to alcohol or other kinds of living. And you see it in every aspect of life, in business and in sports or even in the church where people make terrible decisions not because they had a bad moment or a bad day, but because they're living their life parsed out between what they want Jesus in the boat with them on and what they don't. And it doesn't work that way. If you need a miracle today, the first thing you've got to do is get Jesus in the boat. You've got to get your priorities right. You've got to get a place to where you understand this 
is not something you can do on your own. They didn't need to change their nets or their location. They just needed Jesus. They didn't need another lake. They didn't need new equipment. They needed Jesus. Some of you need to quit complaining about living in Utah. It's the greatest state in the country. This is a great place to live. But that's kind of beside the point. If God has you here, then your issue isn't trying to take the boat to another lake. Your issue is keeping Jesus in your boat here in Utah or wherever it is or whatever it is you're dealing with. Besides that, you go to Kansas, you don't even know where north and south or east and west is unless you're good with the sun, and that doesn't help you when the sun goes down. Number two, if you need a miracle today, and I'm so serious with you today, people's lives are being wrecked and havoc is being done with it every week between my messages to you. And there's also many miracles and happy stories every week in between the messages I preach to you. These are serious times. In case you didn't know it, our inflation rate in Utah for October was 9.3%. Not 7.7 .7 across the nation. In Utah, 9.3%. That's a massive chunk out of your paycheck. And few of you have gotten a 10% cost of living raise, if any of you at all. And you're feeling it. The th second thing we have to do is admit my efforts aren't working. You have to admit th that my efforts aren't working. If you go back to verse 5 in our text, haven't caught anything. Now, that might have gone right over your head when I read through it, but stop and think about it a minute. Do you realize, realize how hard it was for Peter, a professional fisherman, to look at Jesus and admit, we haven't caught anything? Hello? That's hard. We're professionals, but Lord, we haven't caught anything. Sometimes we have to understand our best just isn't going to be good enough. Sometimes we have to admit that we go before the Lord and say, Lord, I've done all that I know to do, and it's not good enough. I've tried in my marriage, but I can't seem to get to a breakthrough point or whatever other example it is. Sometimes we get to a point where we say, I'm just not good enough to get it done. I'm not smart enough, fast enough, talented enough, sensitive enough, quiet enough, loud enough. You get it. And sometimes situations are just simply out of our control. It can be any number of facets, weather, economy, other people, diseases, aging. It's just out of our control. Now, this isn't in your notes, but there are three reasons people don't want to admit that it's not working. I'll give them to you real quick. One is pride. They just don't, out of pride, want to admit it because they don't want to look bad. Number two is stubbornness. They're just not going to change, as we say in the hills, come hell or high water, they ain't changing. Or you might have heard about our mules in Missouri. No, you haven't, okay. They're pretty stubborn, digging in their heels. So we talk about stubborn as an old mule, Missouri mule. And number three is fear, fear of what people will say. So people are afraid to just come out and say, my best isn't good enough. And sometimes people are afraid because they're afraid Jesus will take them in a direction they don't want to go. The third thing you have to do is obey whatever Jesus tells you to do. If you need a miracle today, you're empty. These four steps is what will lead you to that miracle. You have to, number three, obey whatever Jesus tells you to do. Now, that's easy to say. Doing it can be another matter. You and I must be willing to do whatever he tells us to do, even if it doesn't make sense. It's illogical. It's irrational. We don't understand. We're confused or we're scared to death. If we know this is what Jesus is telling us to do, we either do it or we don't do it. We need to do it anyway. 
in verse 5 of our text in Luke chapter 5, it says, But because you say so, I will let down the nets. Because you say so. I highlighted it when we read it. That's the key to miracles. I've said this my entire 36 and a half years here as your pastor. There are pastors that are smarter than I am. There are pastors better looking than I am, though that bar was set pretty high. There are pastors that have advantages that I don't have this, that, and t'other, whatever. But they don't have any more access to Jesus Christ than I do. And the key to my life is the key to your life and the key to every other person's life who needs God's miracle. If you think we're standing here today 36 and a half years later with all the ministries of both the church and the school without a multitude of miracles, miracles, not great leadership, not opportunities, not right place, right location. I hear that all the time. It's like, you people are so dumb. Because when you say all that, you think that God's work is limited to man's abilities. You're nuts. And to hear preachers or Christians say it is really insulting to God himself. The only reason we're here and the strength that we're in today is the miracles of God. It's not Mike Crowder, Marcia Crowder, or Greg and Karen Miller, or all of our staff on school or church side, or any of you that's in the church. We've all done our parts. But we are here by the miracle hand of God that over these years, the miracles are so numerous just from my knowledge and experience, let alone what you've experienced on your side that never got to my ears. It is God that is the difference maker. And when we do what he tells us to do, he'll do the miracles. That's the key. Do what Jesus says to do because you say so. Not because you think it's smart or popular or makes sense or everybody else is doing it. Now notice this isn't in your notes either, but notice what Peter doesn't do. One, he doesn't argue with Jesus. And two, he doesn't delay. Just let that sink in. If you're arguing with Jesus now because you know what you're supposed to do, but you're arguing with him, you're blocking your miracle. And if you're delaying, you're not really arguing, but not today, Lord, not today. Maybe next week, maybe next month. Well, then you're blocking your miracle. What has God told you to do that you're not doing today? Because I'll tell you, he's not going to give you step four, five, and six in your life until you've done steps one, two, and three. I tell people all the time, and for those of you who don't know, I do have a business degree along with some other degrees, but I worked for our old Polkin company for 11 years in the biggest offices over all of Kansas City, Missouri, all of the businesses in Kansas City got a lot of experience in the business world as well and my approach to life from the time I was a 12 year old kid through the business aspect which I was doing while I was also pastoring and so forth was I never tried to answer B until I got A resolved I'm aware of some possibilities of B's I'm aware of a little bit of what C's can be but C can change and B can change after I do A. And so I reevaluate. You can use one, two, three if you want, if you don't know the alphabet process as well. <laughs> but when Jesus says do something, just do it. Peter said, because you say so. And he's not even a believer yet. So Peter became a because you say so person. What is it that he's telling you to do? Maybe it's forgiveness. Maybe it's tithing. Maybe it's volunteering, praying, Bible study, using your gifts, being kind. You know, when our football team at halftime went under the tunnel, which was under the opposing team's uh, student section, well, entire section there, they hailed down expletives. Is that the right way to say that? Curse words is what we hillbillies call it. And flipped off our players. 
And before the second half started, I was talking to one of the coaches, and I said, well, don't worry about it. They'll be at church with their suit and tie on on Sunday morning, and everything will be right between them and God. Why? Because they're parsing out their day-to-day -day living and choices they make versus their Sunday morning appearances. And if you're doing that, you're no better than they are. Hello, are you there? Oh, my. You need to understand something. Disobedience always hurts you. When you disobey God's teaching, it always hurts you. Why? Because disobedience knocks you out of alignment for a miracle. When you disobey God, you're not in line to get the miracle. You've, you're going to veer off the road. Launch out from shore, Jesus says, right now. Do it. Push out to shore. Now, you need to understand this is powerful. That there's no faith without risk. Risk is always involved in doing what Jesus tells us to do. You cannot have faith without risk. When you accepted Christ as your Savior, you received the gift of salvation by faith. And that faith that you exercised in that relationship uh, beginning with Christ came at a risk. A risk to the lifestyle that you've been living, a risk to the relationships of people around you who won't understand. It could be a risk of any number of things. A risk of the security that you've had, based on man faith always requires risk or you're not operating in faith you're just operating in inside a uh, self contained and self uh, made situation in Hebrews eleven six, it says that without faith it is impossible to please God so in other words without risk in your life trusting God and doing what he says you don't have faith working in your life. It doesn't happen. Well, I go to church, and I do this, and I do that. Well, that's all great, but there's a lot of people who aren't Christians that go to churches, including this one, and they've never claimed to be a Christian. They just like the messages, and they believe it helps them and gives them something to chew on in life. But they've never made a claim to Jesus. We've got people all around the world that watch our live stream, literally. And across this country, it's staggering the number of people who watch this. Not all of them are Christians, but they got hooked on God's Word. And we're believing that the Holy Spirit's going to keep working in their lives. And as we have seen, many of these people have come to know the Lord, right? Because the Word, word of God does a work, right? When Jesus says, go into deep waters, because that's where all the big fish are. So don't be just a shoreline Christian, if you please, a shallow end-of-life person. Don't live in the waiting pool. Don't miss God's best and God's miracles because you're afraid of deep water, waves that'll rock the boat or something else. Remember this, faith requires risk, always, always. Number four, and it's the last one, expect Jesus to turn things around. Expect Jesus to turn things around. When Peter said in verse 5, because you say so, there was a level of faith that was involved. In 1 Thessalonians 5.24, it says, the one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. He's faithful, and he will do it. If God controls nature, the fish, y'all come right here and hop in these little nets for these poor professional fishermen. If Jesus can do that, he can take care of you and me. And I tell you in my... Uh, 56 years plus of living for Christ he has been faithful all the way through including my own faults and failures my weaknesses and my internal battles that are common to every human being on this planet I just kept him in the boat I never one time threw him overboard and said I don't want you I knew my hope was in him my trust was in him and that is the same for you today 
You've got to do it his way. Finally, verse 6 and 7 here, not finally, but close. When they had done this, they caught such a great large number of fish, their nets began to break. And so they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came, filled both boats up so that they began to sink. More blessings than they could handle. You need the miracle today. In verse 8 through 10a, continuing the story, when Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. That's the opposite of pride, correct? God won't bless the proud. Isn't that what the Scripture says? And doesn't the Scripture say that pride comes before the fall? Pride's not a good thing. Pride is what got Lucifer in trouble. He began to see all the stuff going on in the glory of God, and he said, well, I want a piece of that action. And that didn't work out so well for him, did it? Go away from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. For he and all of his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. Now, you're talking a professional fisherman, and he's astonished at the catch. You get a miracle from God, you will be astonished. And it will change how you live your life forevermore. And so were James and John. They're the brothers of the other boat, sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. See, they were in business together. This miracle is a turning point in their lives. What was the real lesson? It's the rest of verse number 10. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on you will fish for people this miracle wasn't about the money the fishermen could haul in from that catch it was about God's purpose for their life and today whatever miracle God has for you it isn't about specifically what you will gain out of that it's about your purpose that God has for you in life to set you up or to set you free, to move you forward in the purpose he has for you. 100% living for the kingdom of God. And Jesus tells these four now, now they're disciples, they've come to Christ, that they will be used by God to change lives, homes, and communities. In verse number 11, so they pulled their boats up to the shore left everything and followed him. Now, we talked about old blind Bart last week, right? Bartimaeus. What did I tell you when he threw that old coat? The only real possession he had that was his table of business and his uh, his garment of warmth, everything he needed and had was in that cloak. And he threw it away to follow Jesus, right? Right? And that signified that he was throwing away everything, the security and the comforts of life he was throwing away because when he went to Jesus, he wasn't expecting to come back. He was expecting to get a miracle. And the same thing is true here with these four professional fishermen. They left everything, their boats, their nets, everything that was a sizable investment to follow Jesus. Now they're disciples. They didn't even cash in the fish. They let the people on the shoreline come and have all the fish they wanted and took it home, courtesy of the new disciples in Christ. Why did they do this? Because they were more interested in the blesser than they were in the blessing. If there's ever a challenge I've seen with all of us in the Christian movement in my lifetime, and I think you'll see it in history a lot too, it's common to battle this, is people get caught up in wanting the blessing from God and not the blessing of God or the blesser. We worship, we lift our hands. I don't care whether you lift your hands or whether you don't, but we worship God because we are in love with the blesser. The blessings are the benefit 
of the relationship with the blesser. So I ask you as we close today, how about you? These guys followed Jesus at the moment of their greatest success. I mean, they just had a haul for the ages, and they left it all and said, I'm following you, Lord. Remember, the Bible tells us that these fishermen were uneducated. And they understood that there would be many more blessings if they would follow the blesser. My friends, if you want the blessings, you got to follow the blesser. God's saying you today, take these four steps and let him bless you. I know that some of you are desperate today, and I say that with a broken heart for you, having been there myself from time to time through the journeys of life. I know that helplessness. I know that sense of vulnerability, of tendency to let fear grip your heart, of kind of digging in your heels saying I don't want to go down this road I just I don't want to do this but other forces are pushing you and you're not going to hold them back you're not in control but you can turn your life over to the one who is in control of all things and make sure you keep him in your boat I'm going to close I did this just as if I had time and I've got just enough time really to do this but John Cotton said this, a true believing Christian lives in his vocation by his faith. In other words, when they go to work, they're still a Christian. Not only my spiritual life, but even my civil life. In other words, not just when I'm church, but when I'm out and about in town, in this world. And all of the life I live is by the faith of the Son of God. He exempts no life from the agency of faith. In other words, what he's saying is, is that you live your life with Jesus in your boat in all aspects of your life. And finally, John Calvin says this, and I'm not interested in theological discussions. I just think his quote here is very good. He says, the psalmist testifies that the divine law was his schoolmaster. He's talking about David, the psalmist, the Old Testament. In leading a holy life, that God's word was his schoolmaster and guide in leading a holy life. He thus, by his own example, prescribed the same rule to all of us. And it is highly necessary to observe this rule for which each of us follows what seems good in his own estimation. We become entangled in inextricable and frightening mazes. The Word of God is set in opposition to all human counsels. And what the world judges right is often crooked and perverse in the judgment of God, who approves of no other manner of living than that which is framed according to the rule of His law. That's a little much. Stand with me, would you? But all he's saying is that God doesn't want to be our half God. God doesn't want to be a part-time God. If I, I won't, but if I were to go on and read all, some of all the rest of this, I will say this. In His Word, God's Word, God absolutely forbids every inclination and every effort to break up your life into two parts. One part for yourself and the other part for Him. That kind of covers it. Do you understand? I know we're all human. I know we all deal with our human frailty. We are not perfect. We will not be perfect. There's only one who is and has always been and will always be perfect, and that is Jesus Christ. The Bible says that there was no sin found in him, correct? And we are so blessed that our Lord and Savior died on that cross for our sins. That while we were yet sinners, we could know that he loved us that he died for us, that he's coming back again for us. 
and that death no longer has a stronghold on us because we are promised eternal life in him, correct? And you know the Bible tells us that we can't serve. Jesus said you can't serve two masters. You'll either love the one and hate the other or vice versa. I'm paraphrasing it. So if you're living a dual life, there's no way you're going to get miracles from God. And you're going to wallow in your struggles. Your depression is going to get deeper. Your, de your situations are going to become more delinquent. Your decision making is going to become more terrible. And sooner or later, even if you're skating fate, if you want to use that word, sooner or later, the accumulation of your foolish decisions based out of pride and fear and stubbornness will cost you dearly. In the message that I'm going to share with you in January, the year of breakthrough, I just finished it because I won't be able to write in two weeks for a while after my surgery. So I had to work ahead. And I'm going to tell you in that one of those messages, crises don't just appear out of nowhere. Crises are crises long before they slap us upside the head. For example, your marriage is in crises today, and you probably got some inklings, but you're not thinking crises, but it's there. And you keep ignoring it, and you keep ignoring it until one day he or she slams the door in your face and says, I'm out of here. I'm going to the doctor tomorrow, my six months wellness check. She's going to continue to remind me that I've been in a health crisis for some time. And I've done nothing really significantly to take care of it. It's on me. I'm just telling you. I'm not proud of it. And when I go tomorrow, she's going to give me numbers. I know what they're probably going to be. And if I don't get a hold of that, sooner or later, it's not going to be, oh, pastor's in a crisis. Pastor was in a crisis back here because he needs to lose weight. Hello, are you there? But I'm ignoring it. How about that for giving you a real example? And when the doctor says, I'm sorry, nothing I can do for you now, fiddle. So anyway, whatever you're, you're into right now, please understand, the miracle's there for you. But you've got to follow Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you today for this wonderful congregation of people, both in person and online. Thank you for your word that guides us and addresses our issues. Thank you for those who are being baptized today and moving on forward in their journey with you, making a public statement of faith. Thank you for the gifts that these people give, not only to the support of the ministries here through their tithing, but to the gifts to help those who are needing food, those that will not have Christmas without our help. And I pray your blessings upon each of them for that. If there are those here this morning in this service, in person, I pray that before they leave, they'll come forward and let me pray with them to receive you into their life. If there's people here today, they're not a Christian, but they're ready today to give their life to you, I pray that they will come forward and receive you into their life today. Let me pray with them maybe answer any questions they have for those online right where they're at may they just ask you to come into their life right now and forgive them of their sins and they pledge their surrender of life to you today that your will be done not theirs I pray that for our congregation these doors of miracles will be opened and that we'll see the restoration that is needed the direction that's needed the clarity that's needed. You're a miracle-working God, and we honor you. We worship you with all of our heart. We do praise you from the depths of our being. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you, folks. Have a great day. I'll be right here if you need something, and then we're going to go baptize. Day.